All right. Hello from Seattle, everyone, and welcome to the third and final session uh, of our symposium today, which is on participatory ML boundary objects in practice. Uh, my name is Jess Fulbrook. Uh, I'm one of the leads and co-founders of PAIR, uh, and very glad that you, for everyone who's joining us. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so like I said, uh, we've had two uh, really great sessions already. Um, one in London led by Fernando Villegas on exploring boundary objects uh, in technology. And the second was in Boston with Martin Wattenberg on exploring objective functions as boundary objects. And our session here, uh, I'm hosting from Seattle, is exploring participatory ML boundary objects in the field in practice uh, in use already. If you missed uh, either of the other sessions and you want to check them out and you're on the live stream, you can actually just uh, rewind and go find it and everything will be posted to our YouTube channel uh, after our event. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, oh, also, uh, oh, okay. uh, captions are available uh, at this link, but also probably the easiest way to do it is they're in the description uh, in the YouTube uh, uh, channel right now. So if you would like to use captions, uh, go ahead and click on the link. Next slide, please. Um, and also just taking a moment, uh, I don't need to explain to anyone what uh, 2020 has been like. Uh, we've all been experiencing in our own ways. Um, please, if, if during any of this, if you're watching from home, you need to take a break, don't feel any guilt, home and family comes first. Uh, about 10 minutes before this, I had to go do some area math with my uh, nine-year-old, which I had to look up what that even meant and had to figure these things out. So, you know, we're all, we're all where we are. It's all okay. Um, and please take care of yourself during any of this. Uh, next slide, please. All right. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Chris from University Relations, uh, one of our partners for this event, to, to talk a little bit about them. Thank you so much, Jess. Hi, everyone. My name is Kristen Conrad. I'm a program manager on University Relations. I just wanted to take a quick minute to give a little bit of background about what University Relations is. For context, I helped partner with the pair leads to put on this symposium. And just high level what University Relations is. You know, what we do, we help enable academic collaborations for Google Research, manage and support the interface between academic research and research across Google, promote and support academic research in Google's areas of interest. And we do this for the general good in participating in an ecosystem of academic, industry, and government to create research results and impact that would not otherwise be possible and make the world a better place. This, this symposium is, and all the research you do, is a great example of that. Some of the results include papers, open source codes, data sets, and support all researchers across Google. Next slide, please. I just wanted to also share, we have a variety of different programs across university relations, which offer a lot of bilateral directional flow. Everything from um, scientific exchange, building the next generation of researchers. And all of this leads to, again, the great outcomes that I previously mentioned. Next slide, please. Some of the specific programs we have are the Research Scholar Program, which aims to support early career faculty in pursuing research in fields relevant to Google. The Award for Inclusion Re Research is a global program which recognizes and supports the academic research and computing and technology. We aim to support innovative research and working on positive societal initiatives. Visiting researcher, there's various ways for Google can, that can research with faculty, postdocs, and industry researchers, as well as explore CSR. It collaborates with universities to motivate women to pursue graduate study and research in CS. If any of these seem like it would be a, map, a match for your needs, feel free to reach out to me directly. My information is on the next slide, and we'll also have this available on the symposium website. So thank you so much, and back to you, Jess. Thanks, Christian. Kristen, I appreciate it. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So to set things up a little bit, um, I want to give everyone who might be just tuning into this session a brief overview of the People Plus AI Research Group here um, and what we do. Uh, if you tuned into some of the previous sessions, apologies, some of this is going to sound a little familiar, but I, but I think it's good context. Uh, so the People Plus AI Research uh, team is a group that was started by myself, Fernando Villegas, and Martin Wattenberg uh, a little over, uh, well, depends on when you count it, but let's call it uh, around four years ago. 
Uh, and it's dedicated to human-centered research and design to make people plus AI partnerships productive, enjoyable, and fair. And if you want to learn about everything that we do, there's our website there. Next slide, please. Uh, we're a group uh, that really brings together two disciplines that don't often work together in industry. So a lot of user experience in HCI, and then our machine learning and AI research scientists. We have all different kinds of roles on the team, but we, we really look at how do we find these interesting combinations between the roles that don't often work together. Uh, we're also a fairly uh, globally distributed team. So we have folks in Seattle, Mountain View, uh, Cambridge, New York, Paris, Bangalore, and Accra, Ghana uh, right now. Uh, and we hope that we actually increase the uh, the number of those cities and the number of people in those cities uh, as the years go on. Next slide, please. Um, and a lot of times we get asked, you know, what does Pear do? And so I like to say, you know, Pear does three things. So uh, the first of which, next slide, please, is we start with, we conduct and publish human AI interaction research. That's the foundation of everything we do. We, we try to find out new things and we try to publish that either in peer reviewed academic journals or a few different uh, popular channels. And we have outputs here, um, a couple examples around looking at uh, things like learning embeddings for our People Plus AI guidebook that we released um, uh, not, uh, last year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, second, you know, we're not satisfied with doing research and only publishing. And what we want to do is really enable people. And the way that you do that is by building things and creating tools and platforms. So we create and launch open source tools and platforms to build AI responsibly. One of the ways we look at things is, you know, when people say, you know, people who make AI or ML should do something, we find that should, and we go try to build something that turns that into a people can do that thing. So you can see um, a few of our projects here, uh, like the what if tool, uh, like the embedded projector that allow people to really inspect their data and not allow kids, uh, people who develop AI. Uh, next slide, please. And the third thing is we really try to widen the circle of who can participate in the development and application of AI. So even everything I described right there is still a pretty narrow audience. Those are academic partners, those are developers who are already in the space. And so what we're trying to do is create a wider circle, a wider conversation, more participation. And we do that in a couple of different ways. So on the top is something that one of our um, teams that we partner with, a brilliant group of people called the Creative Lab at Google, Work on called Teachable Machine, which allows you to train uh, an ML model in your browser locally, built on something called TensorFlow.js that was built by the pair team. We also uh, publish quite a bit uh, on our Medium channel, and uh, these range from you know kind of deep think pieces or, or or a piece that might really challenge the way you think about machine learning or AI or who can be included, all the way to like some pretty fun just like Q and As or like what our team is reading. And this is just trying to bring more and more people into this conversation. So uh, next slide, please. Throughout a lot of this work, we've, over the past year or so, really started to focus on the concept of boundary objects, and specifically boundary objects uh, for participatory machine learning. So for some of you watching, that might seem pretty obvious, or you get it. And for others, you're like, oh, great, what does that mean? Uh, next slide, please. So it's framed in this idea of participatory machine learning, which is really uh, a sub, you know, we think of it as a sub or an application of, of the broader field of participatory research or participatory design, um, which is really aligned with our third, uh, you know, th the third of the three things Pair does, right? Broadening a set of people who can help shape AI and machine learning systems. And you know, we're not the first first people to talk about this. Um, there have been some great uh, researchers who have brought this up in the past, and so we try to think about what is our unique com uh, contribution. Next slide, please. And one of the things that we really focus on are what are the boundary objects of machine learning? Okay, but what are boundary objects? Boundary objects um, are concept from sociology where such things like specimens or field notes or maps are used in different ways by different communities, but they bring people together. So that's the challenge is can you create something that's um, an object, a model, an artifact that can allow two groups of people who couldn't really talk to each other in a productive way or an effective way before, this allows them to do that. And so that's what Pair is really focused on, is how do we build more of these to facilitate more of these conversations and build AI in you know, a more uh, responsible way. Uh, next slide, please. So in this session, we're really gonna look at participatory machine learning uh, ML boundary objects in practice. So we've kind of looked at things 
from a theoretical point of view, and then Martin and, and his brilliant panel really zoomed in on objective functions as one particular thing to focus on. And so our panel is going to be all of our talks and panel are going to be all about uh, people who have made something that has made contact with the real world or people that aren't them or ML or AI developers um, and really learn from what happened. There. So we have a lot of different uh, things that can be boundary objects. So you might say, okay, Jess, got it. Like, can you give me some examples? So there are many different ones that range from things that are critical elements of machine learning and AI and how it's developed. So you could have things like use cases or, or boundary objects. Can we agree on the purpose of this, of this model or this product? Data, in many ways, is a, our boundary or is and are a boundary object. Um, objective functions, just the metrics of a system. What is it being optimized for and for whom? Um, we'll see in our talks, uh, art pieces can be boundary objects. They can facilitate conversations that couldn't happen any other way. Um, experiments in prototyping can be boundary objects. Um, and we'll see in one of the talks about how really mapping systems and causal, the causal nature of systems can be boundary objects can facilitate. Um, Pair has put out a few different um, boundary objects in, in a lot of these different ways where we have tools to inspect data like the what if tool or the language interpretability tool that are really for developers and data cards. We have things like publications like um, our People Plus AI guidebook and our AI explorables that are meant to be um, pretty generally accessible and for people who are maybe not the developer building the AI or ML model. We have platforms and experiments that hopefully bring in new people who have never thought about machine learning or AI um, as, a, as a creative tool before. We have TensorFlow.js, we have the Bach Doodle and CocoCo, and then interesting things like GanLab that allow people to, to really just kind of start to play with these things. And then, of course, um, research papers, popular publications, and then we work with policymakers as well to help create um, the, diff the kinds of policies that are really going to encourage responsible AI development. And then, of course, uh, events in these symposia are also a boundary object that help us have these conversations. So with that, you know, we have a lot of these boundary objects in place already, um, but I think, but as we've been saying, it's incredibly important to look at all the different ways that we could um, create boundary objects and what kind of conversations those could facilitate. So next slide, please. Um, so these are our speakers and panelists for this session. Uh, we're going to start with Donald Martin, um, and he's going to talk about uh, causal maps and kind of trying to think about the social implications of a lot of these technologies and decisions and how we can facilitate those conversations. We have Anna Riddler, um, who's an artist in London, who's going to talk about um, data. And uh, I like to think of it as almost the uh, crafted approach to data and model building and what that teaches you about models. Uh, Mindy Della Carpini, who is head of UX engineering for search and assistant at Google, going to talk about um, prototyping uh, and the role that prototyping can play. And then Hannah Wallet, who's a senior principal researcher from Microsoft Research, is going to join us. Uh, for the panel discussion um, to talk about all of uh, her different uh, work in this space. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Um, if you have questions uh, along the way, uh, if you have our Dory link from before, please use that. And if you don't, uh, if you could just email pair-symposium-2020 at google.com, and we'll add your questions to the Dory. Uh, and with that, we would, we're going to get started with the first uh, recorded talk. Sorry, all the talks are recorded. So we're going to start with the first recorded talk uh, by Donald. Hello, everyone. My name is Donald Martin. I'm a technical program manager at Google. The title of my lightning talk is Causal Maps as Boundary Objects for Understanding AI Development Territories. I want to start with a high level assertion that to navigate the perils and promises of AI together, the tech and stakeholder communities need shared understandings of their respective causal theories about how the world works. Now to navigate together requires a map. And a map is the quintessential boundary object as described in the seminal work by Starr and Grissomer about boundary objects. In it, they state that in natural history work, boundary objects are produced when sponsors, theorists and amateurs collaborate to produce representations of nature. Among these objects are specimens, field notes, museums, and maps of particular territories. 
So what might be the territories of AI development? To explore that, let's look at an example of a major failure of an AI system. Many of you are familiar with the recently discovered racial bias in a medical algorithm that is widely used throughout the US healthcare system. The purpose of the system that the algorithm was a part of was to identify patients with the most complex healthcare needs. The idea being that this would reduce the overall cost in the healthcare system. Unfortunately, people not selected for the special programs by the algorithm suffered from nearly 50,000 more chronic diseases than those selected. And the people not selected were disproportionately Black Americans. So how did this happen? The researchers who studied the algorithm and how it was created identified that the root cause of this failure was the target variable selection decision that took place during problem formulation. Now, let's explore how these kind of decisions are made to introduce this concept of AI development territories. Now, problem formulation happens within what we're calling territory one. And within territory one, finance, sales, marketing, and product management people are making critical decisions about which problems to focus on, what the key factors of those problems are, and who the impacted stakeholders are. Decisions made in territory one can have a significant impact on decisions made in territory two. In territory two, you have software engineers and data scientists making critical decisions about data selection, model design, and training and testing. Territory two actually creates the main artifact we talk about in AI, which is the model or algorithm. And when we work on mitigating bias in machine learning, we typically spend most of our time focusing on territory two. But as we discovered when we examined the racially biased medical algorithm, the origins of that bias actually took place in territory one. So when we overly focus on territory two at the expense of examining territory one, it can lead to us missing critical sources of bias that can have devastating downstream impacts. Now, mentioning devastating downstream impacts brings us to territory three. Territory three is civil society, which suffers from the negative impacts of machine learning models when they exhibit bias. Territory three consists of citizens and policymakers and competitors and communities who are also making critical decisions about which problems they want to focus on, what the critical factors of those problems are, who the impact of stakeholders are, and what they're gonna to do to design and implement solutions to those problems. Now, I've talked a lot about decision-making because decision-making is the main activity that takes place in these territories. And as humans, we use our causal inference capabilities to make decisions. Those causal inferences are shaped by strong top-down prior knowledge in the form of intuitive theories. We call those intuitive theories causal theories. And we develop those over time as we gain experience navigating complex realities. Now, when we look at our territories of ML and AI development, realize that the key features of these territories are many different independent, unique models and causal theories that key decision makers hold about the world and how it works. Now, each of these territories is like an independent island filled with many different conceptions of the problems to solve in the world and what the possible solutions might be to those problems. Now there's not very much interaction or mutual awareness between these three territories and that really lacks during the product development process. So it's not hard to understand why there can be mismatches in expectations and problem understanding that lead to harmful outcomes as a result of machine learning and AI development. Now let's take a closer look at what happened with the racially biased medical algorithm to drive home the point that there's a need to work on the problem of limited interaction and mutual awareness between these territories. Now, as a reminder, the problem that the designers and product managers were tasked with solving for this particular algorithm, the medical algorithm, was to select patients with the most complex healthcare needs for special programs. And within territory one, they formulated the causal theory that patients with the most complex health care needs would have spent more money on health care in the past. And this led them to select spending on health care 
as the target variable for the algorithm. Now we know this was problematic and it led to racial bias in the algorithm, but why did that happen? That happened because this causal theory excludes critical factors that impact how much black Americans spend on healthcare independent of healthcare need. These are factors such as underdiagnosis due to bias, lack of trust in the healthcare system, wealth and income disparities, and lack of access to affordable healthcare. These same factors taken together also lead to increased instances of complex healthcare needs in the black American community while simultaneously decreasing how much they spend on healthcare. So there's a big disconnect between the conception of the problem and these two territories. And so this points out the need to bridge the gap between these two territories in terms of how they conceive the problem. There's a need for a boundary object to help do that. So our recommended solution is to introduce form one explicit boundary object creation processes and methods to map these territories during the earliest stages of the traditional product development process. Now, these processes should be optimized to elicit, synthesize, and make explicit the causal theories of target and non-target stakeholders in these three territories. They should center the perspectives of the communities most vulnerable to algorithm bias in participatory and non-extractive ways. And finally, they need to be able to contend with the dynamically complex nature of the societal context in which products will be deployed. Now we've identified, identified community-based system dynamics as a promising practice to operationalize these new methods. And we focused on that because the construction of boundary objects is central to the practice of community-based system dynamics. It's not an add-on. This is made clear based on this quote from the book, Community-Based System Dynamics. It states that the use of informal causal maps and formal models that can be simulated in system dynamics within a group model building session provides a systematic way to negotiate and socially construct a series of boundary objects. Now, we've been spending some time practicing system dynamics with stakeholders, and we introduced them to two main ways to represent causal theories using causal maps. The first is a causal loop diagram representation on the left-hand side. That allows you to express factors or problems and how they're related. I can't go into details about the notations, but that's one key representation for causal maps. The second is a stock and flow representation. This particular representation is optimized to be able to quantify the factors that are present in causal maps so that you can simulate them and gain a deeper understanding. Now, just to demonstrate that people can pick up the techniques for drawing these causal maps pretty quickly, I wanna show you what it looks like in practice for people to do this work with a couple of photos. These folks are actually developing a boundary object about wealth and income disparities after only an hour and a half of introduction to the techniques. This is what it looks like in practice as well in terms of the sorts of boundary objects that are generated. These are key artifacts that help people gain a shared understanding of a complex problem. Finally, you can use software also to represent these causal maps to set them up for simulation. And there's also these, these, these software-based causal maps also serve as powerful boundary objects. So our next steps to kind of pursue this path of creating boundary objects and causal maps for bridging the gap between the territories of AI development are to one, test the efficacy of CBSD and product development so we can identify the constraints of practicing CBSD in corporate environments and partnership with the communities. And then finally, most importantly, we wanna focus on what it takes to build capacity within communities to fully participate and lead because communities are typically the most vulnerable to the negative impacts of biased algorithms. Thank you for your time. I look forward to the discussion that we'll have in the panel. Hello, Paris Symposium 2020. I'm Mindy Doe Carpini, and I'm the head of UX engineering for search and assistant at Google. Today, I'm going to be talking about why prototyping should be a key part of your machine learning product development process. But first, I'll briefly explain a little bit about what I do and how my discipline fits in. So I am a UX engineer. Okay, what does that mean exactly? Well, 
UXCs like myself use our strong technical skills to develop solutions to user-facing problems. Over the years, I've done this for a variety of companies, technologies, and design spaces, everything from websites to applications, operating systems, mobile devices, and a wide range of hardware platforms. Now, machine learning. Often UXC roles include creating prototypes, but I wanna reiterate, prototypes do not just belong to UXEs. We have a broad audience here, so I'll describe a prototype for those not in the know. A prototype is an early version of a product or a feature built scrappily with the intention of gathering information, testing ideas, and answering questions. Here is the truly exciting part. The broad range of available prototyping tools and methods means this key part of the process is accessible to everyone on your team. Let's go deeper on why this is for machine learning for a moment. Remember, your systems are predictive and may change and hopefully improve over time. So a much longer way of saying the outcomes are not 100% predictable, making prototyping all the more important for your products. All that aside, in my experience, the technologies are going to change, but the goal always remains the same, solve user problems. For that, it's important not to forget the user-centered design practices and tools that have worked before. Let me start out by laying some grounding principles I and my team adhere to when prototyping anything using a completely ridiculous product, the cookie detector. Cookie detector will answer with 100% certainty whether the cookie before you is oatmeal chocolate chip or oatmeal raisin. Clearly a top user issue of our time. We'll start off by saying the fidelity of the prototype should match the fidelity of the problem. While your questions and ideas are still broad, like does anyone even find this valuable? Low fidelity options are going to be your best bet. Creating wireframes and lightweight prototypes using tools like ProtoPy, Figma, or even paper can be your best place to start. Try a simple triptych here. User holding up the cookie detector app, pointing it at trays of cookies, receiving a result. Show it to your users and ask, hey, is this valuable? Once you start to solidify those ideas and you've moved into things like, do users understand how to properly focus on the tray of cookies? That's when you want to increase the depth of your technical stack. So we also like to say that even a failed prototype is going to be a success. In fact, this is part of why we make prototypes. Failing earlier, faster, and cheaper allows you to make those bad ideas go away or prove another path is going to be better. If a feature is going to take six months from research to design, that is five months too late to find out you were wrong about the product or the feature. In this case, congratulations, Hero. You saved your company all that valuable time because you built a prototype to answer the very important question, does anyone even want a cookie detector? Finally, prototyping can be a great way to answer any number of questions, but before you dive into that deep end, you must know the question you're trying to answer. It can be as broad as, does anyone find this cookie detector useful? Or as tactical as, do users like the celebratory noise the cookie detector plays for chocolate chips? I know I would. Once you've got that question nailed down, you can start to gauge the fidelity and the tools you're going to need to answer it. With that last grounding principle, let me cleanly lead into the next part of the talk a deeper and more serious dive into how prototypes have been used to answer their shoulds and coulds of product development with two real life case studies. Let's start out with should we, since this is where your product journey should start. At this stage in the game, your goal is going to be to minimize the investment on your path to answers. Unfortunately, no one will ever come up and actually ask you should we do this? And remember, defining that question is critical. I use should we as a placeholder for a range of questions you should be asking, like, does this product meet an actual user need? Does this work for different groups of people in different scenarios? 
Did you make any assumptions in your design, like a dependence on an internet connection? How about, do we expose any ethical issues or privacy sensitivities? Let's look at that case study for personalized recommendation experiments. Now, I don't have to tell you, creating systems that can give users personalized recommendation means developing a deep technical infrastructure, sophisticated machine learning models, carefully managed data sets, AKA months and months of work. We already mentioned that would be bad because a ground rule is that you want to fail fast. Fear not though, there is a shortcut. Wizard of Oz is a super lightweight method used extensively by Google user experience engineers in which a real life human working behind the scenes takes the place of that time intensive system. In personalized recommendation experiments, User researchers can ask study participants to share information ahead of the study about their preferences. Then we use that information to pre-populate prototype screens with optimal choices. My personal technology choices here are Firebase and update triggers with a nice vanilla JavaScript front end, but there are many methods that will let this work. Back to our study. Our wizard here would observe the choices a user speaks or chooses and react appropriately. Wait, they said blueberries, quick, trigger that blueberries screen. And presto, instant personalization for interaction and product feedback on a high fidelity interface with a low fidelity technical personalization system answering the question of, should we? Moving along, I said there were two broad categories of questions, so here comes the second. In resource-constrained product development teams, and I think we can honestly say they all are, this set of questions is gonna come after you've confirmed the direction is sound through early concept prototyping. Now, could we is going to come into play. This is my shorthand for open technical questions the team has to answer including some that are very specific to machine learning, such as, can the team create a model that can reach the accuracy needed to meet the user need? Where did the data used to train the model come from? Are there any biases in the data that we need to mitigate? And what kinds of errors does the model typically make? Our case study here involves the AIY Project's vision kit. One of the demos the team wanted to include was an image classifier trained on the ImageNet data set that was designed to identify a thousand different types of objects. The demo involved pointing a camera at an object and returning a list of what the model guessed it was seeing. In the team's early testing of their hardware prototypes, they depended on off-the-shelf parts like a Raspberry Pi and a standard USB camera because, Reminder, they started by identifying the key question to answer with their prototype, which was how does the image classifier perform? Building hardware devices from scratch was not key to the question, so this was an ideal place to take a shortcut. Back to our case study, what was the outcome? Well, the team found that while the model mostly performed well, it would also produce some interesting side effects. For instance, the model was convinced it had found a bobsled in a tech company meeting room. While these results were generally not problematic and non sequitur at worst and totally hilarious at best, it became clear that addressing this was going to be important for a good user experience. Luckily, the team was able to catch it early and fail fast. Now that we've examined those two case studies and some grounding principles, Let's put it all together. What have we learned? Well, prototypes should be a part of any complete product development toolkit, including and especially one with a machine learning component. Prototypes are a valuable tool that can validate use cases and enable broader exploration. With a groundswell of tools available, prototyping is accessible to everyone on your team. Your prototype should always start with a question that you're trying to answer. From there, you can pick a tool chain and a technical fidelity. Prototypes make failing faster and cheaper and catch problems early for a better, more successful product experience. Oh, 
And one more thing, beware of those lurking bobsleds and avoid tricky oatmeal cookies. Thanks everyone and enjoy the symposium. Uh, all right, we are back. I hope everyone really enjoyed those talks. I, I don't know if I want to go bobsledding or eat cookies more, and usually it's always the latter. Uh, so really enjoyed that. Uh, I hope everyone at home did, uh, or is watching at the live stream as well. It's the second time I've got to watch all those recorded talks. I took new notes this entire time as well. Uh, so now we are back uh, with our panel. So uh, we're we have uh, Donald and Mindy here with us. And then joining us is Hannah Wallach uh, from Microsoft. Um, and I want to do just a little bit more of an intro for uh, Hannah. Uh, so Hannah is a researcher who looks at fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics. Um, she's done so for uh, for quite quite some time. Uh, she also is the co-founder of two uh, projects to, well, three really, uh, to increase women's involvement in free and open source software, the Debian Women and the Known Women's Summer Outreach Program, now called Outreachy, uh, and also is one of the co-founders of the Women in ML uh, workshop and, and group. So uh, welcoming Hannah uh, and Donald and Mindy back. Welcome, everyone. Hey. Okay. Um, so I'd like to kind of start us off, um, you know, kind of getting into this place uh, that one of the things I got from Anna's talk was I really like the way that she phrased things about when she put up the pictures of the tulips of talking about placing things back into the world. Uh, you know, machine learning and AI tends to take something from the world and, and put it into a model. And this was really kind of putting it back into the world. And I think that that's really the theme of all the talks that we were that, that we have in this session, which is essentially what happens when we try to put these things back into the world. Right. Um, and so I think one of the things that popped out to me um, and Donald, I'd, I'd like to kind of start with you and, and to get your thoughts on this of. You know, one of the biggest challenges in building machine learning or AI systems seems to be the unstated assumptions by the builders. This was something that was actually touched on in the previous panel. Um, and this often manifests as exclusion for different stakeholders and users or, or harmful consequences. So I'd like to, to hear a bit about maybe what have each of you found to help make some of these unstated assumptions explicit or how do we get them out when people may not even realize they have them themselves? Thanks, Jess. Uh, and again, thanks for having me on the panel. And uh, and it's been great to participate in this. So so one of the things about unstated assumptions, I think it's important to be clear about what kind of assumptions you're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think so, something that's really instrumental are causal assumptions. Those mm -hmm. are those are these assumptions people make about like what causes what like and it, it's a conception of the of the problem that people are trying to solve. Right. So people have in their mind, oh, this happened because of this. Um, and when and that setup kind of leads your thinking in terms of how you want to solve the problem. Uh, this happened because of this. If I do this, this is going to solve the problem. Uh, and so those those sorts of assumptions have all these kind of embedded stereotype and beliefs and values that can kind of lead to these biases that make their way further downstream and they're hidden and they're, and they're hard to see. So it's really important to kind of like understand what kind of assumptions you're talking about. And I think the calls and ones are really important. Um, I think you, you pointed out that the exclusion, um, sometimes uh, exclusion doesn't seem like oh, someone got excluded, but it actually leads to real harms, uh, like as the case with the racially biased medical algorithm. So lack of mm -hmm. access to uh, these programs, you know, it's not hard to imagine that people, this could have led to people dying um, or, or losing income because they couldn't go to work, those sorts of things. Um, and then the, uh, the final piece in terms of helping, helping make things explicit, um, I think the first thing is just kind of awareness by stakeholders of how important their assumptions are in this in this overall system uh, that is creating a new type of system. Like these are really instrumental factors um, in trying to understand the problem. Uh, and you know those assumptions are important. So just that awareness uh, that these are like high stakes kind of uh, decisions that are made based on these assumptions is, is important. That awareness. And then this, and the second thing is making sure there's a safe environment for people to actually make their assumptions explicit. So sometimes when you're talking about these high stakes problems, uh, it could be you have to be really vulnerable to say, oh, I think this is causing that, or this is why I think about you know this group or this historical situation. Um, and so, but if it's not safe, people are not actually going to you know be truthful, right, about what their actual assumptions are, um, and then that kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, and I think the final thing is important to actually have like you know, an actual, you know, methodology uh, for like going through this process of making them, making these assumptions explicit and a notation for representing them and making them legible. 
Um, because if you kind of do it in a ad, ad hoc way, it kind of uh, reduces the value. It's hard to reuse the knowledge later. Um, so I think that's another kind of critical aspect, like a notation, a methodology. Mm-hmm. And that's what actually helps you create like a boundary object, right? That is plastic mm-hmm. and reusable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Hannah, Mindy, any, any thoughts on this one? Yeah, maybe I can jump in here. So I absolutely love Donald's talk. It really resonated with me. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about assumptions and worrying about assumptions. And a couple of things I wanted to mention. So um, I think I'm coming at this from a, a slightly different methodology and notation and place. But I wanted to flag the framework of of quantitative measurement modeling from the social sciences as a way of surfacing, making explicit, and then testing assumptions. So within the quantitative social sciences, people often want to measure unobservable theoretical constructs. So maybe it's something like ideology, maybe it's something like community membership, this kind of thing. Um, and in the way that one typically does this is you you posit a model for for measuring whatever the construct is. Um, but rather than just sort of make a bunch of assumptions, posit your model, build it, go off and run with it, before you actually go off and use that model, you um, assess first the reliability of the model. So are the measurements repeatable? But, and this is the point I wanted to get into, are the measurements doing what you think they are? In other words, what is the match between the theoretical construct and how you've operationalized it in a model? In other words, were your assumptions valid? And so when I was listening to Donald's talk, this, I. I I kept coming back to these measurement modeling ideas from my own work. Um, I have a paper with um, Abby Jacobs from University of Michigan on measurement and fairness that lays out some of these ideas in the context of fairness. And it really felt like uh, Donald was talking about a lot of the same things that I've been thinking about there. We do make assumptions when we move from sort of the abstract theoretical kind of world into actually putting this stuff into models. And I think that example of operationalizing care needs as care costs, because care costs can be easily measured, is a great example of this. And so this is somewhere where we found that that framework of construct validity can be really helpful for teasing apart, did we do this right? Did we get this wrong? And what are the consequences going to be? So there's six different types of construct validity. There's two I want to, I, that, that you would typically look at, and you would look at all of them. There's two I want to flag here. One is content validity. So did I get the content right? And that really is about those assumptions that I think Donald was talking about. The other one I want to flag, which relates to your comment, Jess, about putting things back into the world, is consequential validity. If I take my model with all these assumptions and the way that I've operationalized things and I use it in the real world, what are the consequences gonna, gonna be? Who is gonna be harmed by this? Who is gonna benefit from this? So I think this is a, a different methodology, a different notation, a different framework to the one that Donald was talking about, but gets at many of these similar ideas as well. So I got very excited about all this. <laughs> That's excellent. That's excellent. Do, do you mind if I just say a couple of things related to what Hannah was saying? Um, I just love the way- It's a she- panel. It's a yeah. channel. Let's do it. Yeah. I just love the way you framed that. And it, it wasn't kind of clear in what I presented, but this kind of quantitative aspect, one of the reasons that we kind of started to practice system dynamics is because there's a qualitative aspect and a quantitative aspect where you yeah. actually do get to the point where you're kind of measuring things and you're validating the hypothesis. So yeah. you create this kind of causal structure, right? You, mm-hmm. you create this construct um, and then you, you model it in a way where you can kind of quantify certain aspects of it. Hopefully you have data that's been measured already. And then you validate your hypothesis, right? Yep. Um, and that's kind of the basis for actually trying interventions to try to understand the mm-hmm. consequences, right? So simulation is like a key part of that whole methodology. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it gets at a lot for the same reasons that you described. So I'm looking forward to us uh, chatting more uh, after the panel. <laughs> Do you mind if I hop in with one more thought there? Um, yeah. as well. what, a, um, what a polite panel. Yeah, of course, hop <laughs> in. Every, everybody go. Yeah. Um, it, you said something about uh, thinking about the consequences. And I think one of the exercises we do in UX 
is writing the headline. And I think this may also be very mm -hmm. interesting, mm -hmm. not just, you know, the best case scenario headline, but what are the worst case scenarios of what we could be putting into the world? And does that give people a voice for these concerns and to also talk about their assumptions? I, I, I love that there's, um, yeah, I think too, you know, Mindy, one of the things that's really interesting about that, the headline writing, and I wonder if this, some of the causal mapping and some of these others, is it, you know, there's a utility in maybe letting people be someone else uh, because it lets them step out of themselves and try to be the headline writer for this thing or, or, or something like that. Um, and then Hannah, I think your, your comments on the validity are, are really fascinating because, uh, so as a social psychologist, uh, you know, we've been going through the replication revolution or the credibility revolution or the replication crisis, depending on how you put it. But it's funny because in ML and AI, they, they have actually massive reproducibility challenges and problems as well. And I feel like they're almost just trying to figure out one form of validity, which is like this hyper contained experiment that can kind of run on, you know, a, a very contained benchmark. Uh, and then, you know, becomes quite brittle with contact with the real world or, or any of the other kinds of validity that you would typically look at from a, you know, a scientific frame. Um, that's a whole other panel, I feel like. Uh, so, so, so as not to, not to commandeer, um, I, one of the other things that really stood out to me about the, the three of you is that every, every one of you is trying to design you know, a, a boundary object or a conversation or understanding for a really diverse set of stakeholders. Um, and I think this is one of the things that has been frankly challenging in the AI machine learning space is how many people are involved in when you say we wanna do it the right way. Um, and so you know, I think about things like you know, creating boundary objects for users or end users, uh, developers, uh, policy makers, uh, communities, like, like all these different groups. Um, and really, a lot of times they have different and conflicting goals, right? It's it's one thing to write them down, and sometimes you write them down and you realize nobody agrees, or they actually want the opposite uh, things. So I'm really interested in in maybe what what you all have all found about you know the challenges or the tricks or the most challenging parts of this process. And, and Hannah, I was going to start with with you on this one um, because I, I also think you've kind of convened a lot of these groups and. And, and you know, yeah. What do you do when people don't agree? Yeah, this is a big one. Um, I spend a lot of time wrestling with this one, um, and I think one of the things that stands out to me the most. This is. I think I'm going to answer this in a little bit of a meta kind of way, but just with some things that popped into my my head as you were as you were asking that. Machine learning, so I've been doing machine learning for about 20 years at this point. So mm -hmm. since way before this stuff was what it is today. And when I got into machine learning, it was this primarily, if not entirely, academic discipline, where the only stakeholders that you ever needed to interact with were other academics working in machine learning. And you know, this is not the world that we're living in now. And I think it's only become clear within the past couple of years that the number of different types of stakeholders in machine learning is huge. It's basically every single person in society at this point. And that's a really, I guess, shocking and almost sobering position to be in, especially for many people who came into machine learning a long time ago. We used to just sort of primarily interacting with other machine learning people or other computer scientists, this kind of stuff, to suddenly be told, no, those aren't your stakeholders. You have to interact with all these other communities as well. It's quite a daunting task. Um, and I think in many ways, for me, this really feels like the public understanding of science crisis of our time. And I know it's dramatic to put it like that, but as I look around, I see so many people who are engaging with machine learning in so many different ways, including people who are, who are making laws about machine learning, including people whose lives depend on machine learning. And yet in so many cases, folks from the machine learning community are not actually communicating, collaborating, and working with those people. And I think this is a public understanding of science crisis. I really do. I don't quite know what to do about it. This is the kind of thing that keeps me up at night. But I think it is something that the machine learning community really, really has to tackle head on. Um, 
one of the things we've been thinking about a bunch at Microsoft is how do you communicate with, for example, customers of things like pre-trained APIs. So as you know, Microsoft has, has cognitive services, which is a bunch of pre-trained models that are available by mm -hmm. APIs for people to use. How do you communicate with people, not, not necessarily the technical developers who are going to read the API documentation, but other stakeholders who might want to, let's say, commission systems that are going to be built on those APIs, about their characteristics and limitations. And this is something we've been thinking about a lot. We, we've been, we put out a few of these um, transparency notes at this point. You can think of transparency notes as being kind of similar to model cards that I know um, Google uses a lot of that have a lot of details about model performance and stuff like that. Similarly, data sheets or data cards as they're called at Google, which have information about data sets. Transparency notes are intended for a bit of a different audience and are really trying to capture those sort of characteristics and limitations. What should you use this API for and what shouldn't you? And these are the kinds of conversations that I think we really, really have to start having because otherwise we're going to be in this situation with all these different stakeholders with conflicting goals and everybody just pretending that we're all on the same page when in fact we're very much not. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know, those are some of the things that I, I think about. I guess one other sentence I'll quickly throw in there. When you said different conflicting goals, I, I, I thought of this paper by Brent Mittelstad. I think it's called Two Principle to Fail or something that talks about the fact that when you have these like high level responsible AI principles, everybody's like, yeah, fairness, yeah, transparency. They're all in on this because it all sounds very reasonable. But once you actually into the details of what these things mean. Once you get to that sort of nitty gritty, that's where the disagreement starts. And that's where I think things get really interesting, but really hard. Anyway, I'll, I'll pause there. But. So, so Jess, I, I mean, I'll jump in because there's, there's a couple of phrases that popped out at me. One is, um, you know, disagreement is data. Disagreement is knowledge. Mm. Like the whole point of mm -hmm. of doing like group model building sessions is because you're trying to get at those conflicting goals because those conflicting goals are driving the dynamics of the problems that you're trying to solve. So so it's that's actually kind of gold, right? That disagreement and, and being able to to kind of discover you know what the landscape of disagreement is. That's a that's the first thing. Uh, and then the second thing, I actually uh, Hannah was talking about the you know, crisis of public understanding science. I actually think it's the crisis is science understanding the public. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we should start thinking about it the other way because uh -huh. uh, you talked about how it's kind of daunting, right? Uh, for scientists to kind of think about all the stakeholders and all of society. Um, and so this is why we wrote this paper uh, called uh, Extending the Abstraction Boundary for Machine Learning uh, Development to include societal context, right? Because everyone knows, hey, we really need to understand the context of where we're going to deploy this, this, uh, this system or this algorithm, you know, that's critical. Um, but people kind of stop there because it's so daunting because you realize you have to think about all of society. You actually have to have some sort of way to kind of, you know, grapple with that. You just can't, you can't walk away from that if you're really going to try to tackle fairness and ethical, um, fairness and ethical AI. And so it's daunting, but we really don't have a choice right, uh, based on the impact of these technologies. And, and it starts with us having to flip the responsibility for who needs to understand who, right? The crisis is, mm -hmm. is science's ability to, to understand society and the public. Catching on to a couple of those things, I think um, creating the proper kinds of artifacts is also helpful here. So for instance, I talked a lot about prototypes for user research and things, but they're also an excellent alignment tool. Um, so you use it yourself and go, is this what we meant? Hand it to as many users as possible who are within your team and understand as they walk through it, listen to how they're using it, listen to where they see the gaps. But I think that there's another interesting thing to think about here, which is, are there visual presentations that make sense to different groups of users? So if you're doing color extraction, does it mean building a very quick website to show you put in this kind of image, these are the things that pop out. And again, these are more innocent examples, but but the idea of thinking about tuning the presentation of the information to the audience it's for. Maybe I can yeah. just jump in there about, about 
prototypes. So, so Mindy, I loved your talk as well. And actually, it, it got me thinking back to when I first joined Microsoft as a researcher, and I was coming from academia, so I didn't have a lot of experience working with product teams. And I was collaborating with a couple of folks in MSR. We had some ideas that we thought could be really awesome, and we wanted to get taken to product teams and get buy-in. And so we met with a lot of product teams, and we would tell them what we had in mind. And they would go, okay. And then we would go to the next one and tell them what we had in mind, and they would go, yeah, okay. And nothing came out of it. And so finally, we thought, okay, this is just not going to work. We're going to build a prototype ourselves. And so we sat down and we built a prototype of what we had in mind. And we took that back to the product teams. We said, this is what we had in mind. You could see the light bulb going off. By working with a prototype, we were able to suddenly use that prototype as a way to make sure we we're on the same page, to ground the conversation, to spark sort of directions off of it, none of which had happened without that prototype. And it really changed my thinking around this kind of, of these kinds of sort of collaboration opportunities, or maybe, maybe I guess I even mean communication opportunities, where you're just trying to see, do we want to collaborate? I just couldn't believe what a difference it made to actually have that prototype to ground those conversations. So I don't know, I got really excited about this, this idea of prototypes. I haven't, I haven't been thinking about this for, for quite some time, but I got super excited when I heard your talk because it, it really resonated. I think um, something else that's interesting about artifacts is it gives everyone something to almost throw stones at. No. Uh, see this? This is what we mean. Oh, but that's not what I meant. Or what about this? Or what about this other problem? Once you have an object, then people have to react to it. Just another reason you want to build these things as cheaply as possible, but also targeted at your audience. Hey, take this. What does this mean to you? What does this trigger in your brain? Yep. Yeah. yeah I, I think, oh. I'll just gonna say one thing. I think, uh, I mean, what you what you just said, uh, Mindy, really resonates with me because I think that it gets back to these boundary objects. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to negotiate the boundaries. Like, you know, what you know, what you know, what do you consider like part of the system? What do you actually consider the problem? What do you consider, you know, uh, what's kind of endogenous to the problem that you're trying to solve? And I, I can see how prototypes can help help do that because you kind of have like you've actually kind of prototyped a solution to some sort of problem. And it helps expose your thinking about even what the problem is. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's uh, Mindy, when you were talking in, in Hannah as well, like it really connects to Donald's comment about disagreement as data. And prototypes allow you to disagree, right? So when Hannah's like, we went and showed them, and they were like, meh, like the worst reaction you can get is th that, like, that's great. Or whatever, you know, the, the kind of non reaction, because you'd, you'd rather somebody love it or hate it. But it's really hard to to find that without the specifics, right? Um, and even, even with even in more of an academic context, but but also in an industry context too. The other thing I found about prototypes is that, and and I think this is just going to sound really obvious, but I I'm going to say it anyway. If you can prototype using data of the person that you are prototyping this for, it makes it all the more real. When people see their own data, their own circumstances reflected in the prototype, that suddenly brings up a whole set of conversations that you don't have if you're doing this with some like abstract data. And so that's another way that I've really sort of, you know, even if you're just sort of very lightly prototyping things, it's just another way of making this stuff real. I I could not even begin to agree more. I want to high five you, but we're on GVC. Um, I, I talk, touched on it a little bit. Yes, high fives uh, a little bit in the personalization prototypes, but it's not even just about that. Um, when you show someone something, it's like, oh, check this out. It's about sports. And they look back at you and go, but I don't care about sports. You're eliciting a completely different response than if you decide ahead of time, music, recipes, cats, whatever it is. And then they can put themselves in the place of how they would react to it in reality. So it's very important to understand the question you're asking, but also the context of the user who's using that prototype, and therefore what kind of a response you're gonna elicit. Hey, one other thing that jumped in my mind is that of how important it is to also prototype the problem as well as prototype mm -hmm. the solution, right? Because because the, you know, the, the kind of understanding of the problem is something that you need alignment on as well. 
and so that is another thing that uh, why we the way we think about these these artifacts you generate in the first part of SD, right? You're prototyping the problem, and yet it's visual, so people can look at your prototype of the problem and critique it and say, now this the problem is really this. And 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 Hannah, you mentioned people's circumstances, right? This is exactly what you want to do. You want to be able to like be prototyping problems that are proximate to these folks, right? And, and get to the point where they can prototype them themselves, right? Build capacity so they can prototype the problems themselves. And, and that's the beginning of working towards solutions together. These are, these are great points. It makes me think of, actually, when I was at Microsoft almost 10 years ago, and we were building a Photos app, and it was the whole thing even then of having them bring in their photos because you know you look at other people's it's kind of like when you go to the frame store right and there's other people's families and they're like yeah it's it's fine it's fine and then as soon as people put their own in they're like you know if you have a one big image and a bunch of little images they're like why is the one big image that should be my kid why wouldn't that be my kid like and it, all of a sudden it's like an emotional reaction to this thing versus the like it's fine yeah sure it looks good the photos are all there I um yeah. Donald, you said, oh, can I have one more thought? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, Donald, you said something really interesting, which is about creating um, or prototyping the problem and prototyping the solution in that way. Another interesting approach I've seen is where users come in and sketch their solutions. And I think that's kind of interesting as well, because it's not just the problem, the people who are deeply within the problem space answering it. But they can sit down with pen and paper and go, it does this, and then it does this, and then it does this. And you get not only this idea of how does that person think the world works, but also what is an ideal outcome for them. And because it's just paper and pencil, completely accessible to everyone. You know, prototypes are not always code. They they can be anything that can help you express the run through of your solution. Yeah, I yeah, I love that. And I and I and I and I when I was listening to you talk, I was just hearing the the kind of causal, the causal aspect of this it does this, mm -hmm. and then it does this, and then it does this. Like we're such kind kind of causal animals, and to be able to express like one what you think is causing something, and one how you think you can you know do something to cause that problem to go away, like is just so embedded in this. Yeah, those are great points. I, I remember too. We've been in the past a like Lona designer. So like a designer will come out with us to like talk to people on like a visit and, and actually like basically like take everyone, take a participant or somebody's ideas up a level of articulation. And one, it helps them articulate. And two, you know, people love it, right? Like who wouldn't like their their great idea, you know, <laughs> articulated by somebody who who kind of who's a you know a skilled professional in that craft. Um actually hit on so many interesting uh topics in there. I, I think that. You know, in a sense, we've we've gotten a little bit about this, but um, I, I have one question here about some of the more, you know, Mindy, this was really, I wanted to start with you, which was, you know, some of the more surprising ways you've seen boundary objects uh, increase participation. So not just, you know, they all, all kind of like can let it happen in some way, but increase it. And I think that we already kind of got on this, um, you know, in terms of the ML system definition, we haven't talked as much. We, it's interesting. We've been very at the beginning. We haven't talked as much about like the iterative process of like, okay, you're building something and you think you have a good idea and you realize you're changing it. Um, and so the thing that stands out to me is the bobsleds, right? Is the like how the mistakes can be so fascinating, right? And these range from, I, I think, you know, in the talks, we saw these range of the consequences of a mistake, right? Like Donald was talking about very serious mistakes. And then Mindy was kind of talking about like, you know, it's funny there, oh, I thought there was a bobsled there. And, and like, how do we, you know, how do we use mistakes or, or, or what are some of these surprising ways that we found that they can increase participation or have better conversations or whatever that might be? Yeah, I think, I think seeing the outcomes, even the mistakes almost helps people to reframe their understanding of how a system mm -hmm. works. So I think um, I was in a conversation yesterday where we we saw, you know, a case where some subset of images things worked really well for. In the other case, it was a different kind of images. And um, to someone not deeply in the machine learning world, of course, you know, they're images. Images are images that should just work. It should be able to separate them from their backgrounds. Um, but I think what it led to was a really interesting conversation around, well, why did this fail? Um, what part of the conversation were we not involved in and what questions did we not ask up front? Like what 
were the data sets that this was trained upon? What were the, I guess, uh, just the objective function in this case, what were we trying? What was success for us? And it helped the team to really kind of converse around that and understand that they needed to be involved earlier and ask a different subset of questions versus just looking at the outputs and making some guesses about how it worked. I mean, one thing that, that we discovered when we started to work with uh, community organizers and advocates uh, with system dynamics, it surprised me that the, you know these folks spend like decades thinking about a particular problem, um, but oftentimes they don't have a way to articulate the complexity of it, to communicate it. And so it's all in their head. And so once we gave them a way to like actually express this complexity and some of the hidden things like feedback loops and time delays, there was this big burden. They felt like this big burden off of their shoulders. They're like, finally, I can express how complex this is to someone other than me um, in, in a language that we both understand now. Uh, and then they just felt like, hey, I know these are huge problems, but it doesn't feel as hopeless because I can at least write it down and I can express the complexity. And so that kind of led to like more participation. And that ended up leading to us, you know, doing a, um, you know, a paper uh, with some of these folks that had just started SD uh, about healthcare and machine learning, right? And so, and so this kind of removed this kind of even fear of engaging with this complex topic of, of machine mm -hmm. learning because they felt grounded in being able to express complexity. Um, so that that surprised me, uh, you know, that kind of the relief people felt just from being able to express express that that complexity. Yeah, I guess I guess maybe I want to jump in with just a couple thoughts on on this one as well. I sort of got lost in a stream of thoughts <laughs> over the past couple of minutes um, because I think this idea of mistakes or errors as boundary objects it is really powerful. A um, couple things I want to mention. Firstly, you know, I, I learned about machine learning a million years ago when machine learning was done very differently. And the way that I would understand the models that I had developed was by doing serious error analysis, right? So for example, if I'm developing, let's say a classifier, yeah, okay, I got all these things right, but what did it get wrong and why? And digging into every single mistake it would make, make would really, really help me understand the assumptions behind my model, how they were playing out in practice. So this ties back to the assumptions point, I think that, that Donald was making earlier as well. Um, and really see my the models that I was developing or, or even the training algorithms, whatever I was working on in this whole new light. And so that whole notion of error analysis as being a really important part of the machine learning life cycle is something that that I, I think is critical and really needs to be to be made explicit. On top of that, I, I read a bunch of these NIST reports on facial identification and verification systems a couple of years ago and there was a piece in that there was a sentence in there i'm going to get this wrong but there was a sentence in there that said look we are going to report error rates not accuracy rates and we're going to do this one because of a high 90s effect people can't really they just can't really perceive these differences between you know whatever it is 97 and 96 it's like oh whatever um whereas when we're talking in error rates which are much smaller numbers these differences become more salient on top of that the human costs are proportional to errors right so so when we're thinking about the costs to humans and and sort of the the burden placed on humans by mistakes that that is proportional to the errors that these systems are making and so by focusing on error rates rather than accuracy rates we take this more sort of human-centered perspective and i thought this was fascinating and it really sort of reframed even how i think about reporting model results as well but again highlighting that importance of errors as being sort of a boundary object for different different you know bringing in all of these different communities and the importance of errors and understanding the human impacts of systems Donald, I think you made a, a really interesting point that also linked with what Hannah was talking about. Um, interrogating errors matters. And as a machine learning practitioner, Hannah, you've done this a lot. Donald, in your case, it's about giving voice and giving vocabulary for discussing and having that conversation. And are there, 
does is there a way to tie these back together? Are are there vocabularies that work better for certain groups, or does it depend on their goals? And how can we expose more of this language for productive conversations? Yeah, I was I was Hannah got me thinking. Like I got I went to the one of those states as well. I was like, hmm, because this this linkage between the error of the of the kind of system, the ML system. The linkage between that and the cost to humans it's not a straight mm -hmm. like there's some interpretation that has to happen right mm -hmm. so i've got this error but what does that what does that actually translate into human cost it takes this other you have to go through this other you know network of like assumptions right mm -hmm. about like what impact this is going to have on somebody's real life mm -hmm. um which which is like i think why you know your your hypothesis in the beginning of like what the problem is right um it's something else that you might have to bring in because like you know when, when you're doing testing of something your testing should be based on your requirements in the beginning and your use cases in the beginning and so you know how can we get to where our error analysis is based on these assumptions we made about the problem in the beginning um i, I don't know how exactly that fleshes out but it seems like there's something uh, interesting there so this this relates to a, a discussion that that took place at the fact conference a couple of years ago and again i'm probably misremembering bits of it so you know take everything i say with a grain of salt but john kleinberg gave a really interesting talk and talked a lot about abstraction and then there was a discussion between him and jen wartman vaughn at the end and they dug into this idea of abstraction as a thing that sort of computer scientists do you go from this like messy real world you sort of abstract to this nice, neat, kind of clean theoretical world. You then make a bunch of progress in your nice, neat, clean theoretical world. And the point that kept coming up was that then people forget to map this back to the messy world when they're talking about the benefits or the impacts or the, the errors, you know, all of this stuff of what they, they've done. And so this, this, you know, because I think it relates to measurement modeling and all of these other things I'm interested in, really stuck in my head of, you know, we do as computer scientists put all this time into sort of abstracting from the real world into this beautiful theoretical framework, but abstract or, you know, going in the opposite direction, whatever the opposite of abstracting is, going in the opposite opposite direction back to that messy real world, people often forget to do that bit. Yeah. Yeah, that, that reminds me of a quote from a paper, I'm not going to remember the authors, but it was a paper on problem formulation. And they had a line in there where they were talking about, because that's when you're to abstract, you basically you're creating a model, right? <laughs> and you know that you know all, all models are wrong, some are useful. But this yeah. quote actually talked about how you know you do violence, you know, uh, you know, on the real world, when you create these abstract models, right? You're you're doing some, you know, actually doing some violence, right? Because you're simplifying things, and and when you're doing that, those simplifications are where there's these these risks for harm come come in, yes. right? Um, and so I always, that quote always sticks out with me in terms of like the really the high stakes of these early abstraction and modeling decisions that are being made, and they're being made based on you know these causal theories that we have in our head about how the world works. And if we're not, if, if those assumptions aren't you know, informed by a broader set of causal theories about how the world works, right, we're doing even more violence, right, when we're, when we're, when we're doing that modeling and that abstracting. Yeah, I would, I would say, and, and as always, the, the half hour <clears throat> flew by, but one, one thing that's really actually stood out to me in this last conversation is, what's fascinating is whether it's an accuracy rate or an error rate, it is treated as a constant. And, but when it is fed into a system, it can be multiplied, it can be uh, fed into a feedback loop, it can be diminished. And Donald, I think this is with, with all these models, is like we tend to think about things as these constants that come out. Uh, if you build a prototype of it, all of a sudden you realize, oh geez, that's right, that thing we thought would happen once actually happens 10 times and they're not independent. The, the 10th time is, is, as soon as you get to the fifth time, the 10th time is almost guaranteed at that point. Um, and I feel like that's one of these, it's something that, that's really popping out, you know, if, I don't know how many, you know, error rate tables or accuracy tables of like, you know, some soda paper where you're like, oh yeah, you did it. And then you're like, yeah, but what does that mean? Because you isolated it outside of a system that can manipulate that value. Um, <clears throat> Uh, there's, there's also yeah. these, I know we're over time, but there's also these kind of delayed impacts, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you do your measurement, mm -hmm. right? And it hits the world, but mm 
but you that that the actual error you don't realize it for like you know another month, right? Uh, yeah. Because if, sometimes the feedback loops are slow, so the delayed impacts are something else that you have to kind of keep in mind. You won't, you may not see it right away. Yeah. Um. All right. I'm trying to think of a way of how I can. I don't have to stop the panel now, but I think we're out of time. Uh, this this was really enjoyable. This like flew by. I could be here for another quite a while. Hopefully, we'll get to chat a little bit more. Uh, thank you, all three of you, uh, for for participating in this. Uh, I, this was like genuine fun. Uh, which is which is just great, um, and I learned a lot. Uh, I hope I hope you all do too. Um, and I think with that, we'll wrap up the panel. Um, and yeah, the next thing we have on the agenda, if you are signed up for one of the breakout sessions, uh, they'll be starting in about fifteen minutes. Well, uh, about thirteen minutes right now. Uh, there was kind of unexpected. Uh, demand and interest for those, so so not everyone got in, but thank you for if you expect interest and you, and you couldn't. Um, this is the end of the live stream. Uh, next session, or sorry, <laughs> next slide, please. Um, if you want to keep the conversation going uh, on social media, we have the hashtag, there's our website, the Medium, and the, the YouTube channel, um, which has our previous uh, symposia as well, which were excellent uh, also, and they'll be up there. Um, and yeah, uh, next slide, please. And if you're not in a breakout session, uh, it's kind of crazy, but that's it. We're, we're done with this uh, symposia again. Um, and hopefully we will see you all next year. So thank you very much for everyone who tuned in. Bye.